One of our scriptures for this week is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. In verses 6 and 9, it talks about the retribution for whom? The pastor just said a key word was what? F A I T H. The word faith and belief or unbelief in the Bible come from the same root word. So for the unbelievers, the Jews that have what? No faith, there's what? Retribution. Now, who would like to volunteer to read verse 10 of 2 Thessalonians? 2 Thessalonians. It says that when he shall come, he will to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Thank you, Lord. The first key word here is what? Glorify. What does the word glorified mean when used in the Bible? It's describing the character of Christ. And a people that have what? Have decided to what? Follow him. Yes, identify with him. I love this verse. When he comes to be glorified, where? In you. We're dealing here with evidence. Who's on trial here according to Romans 3, 4? God. God is on trial. He's the one that's made all these promises. And now he's looking for <laughs> someone that he can call in a day, of his day in court and say what? Here's evidence that what I did 2,000 years ago works. Glorified in his, sin, in, in his saints on that day. That's what we're focused on. Not preparation for the end time or Jesus' return. No. That day. That day is the day that you and I make happen. We are the ones that determine when Jesus comes back. In his saints on that day. And to be what? Marvel at among all who have what? Believe. Believe what? <clears throat> Let's turn to 2 Corinthians, last chapter, 13. 2 Corinthians, last chapter, 13. You're being tested this morning from the scripture. What you do with this is your own business, personal matter between you and God. But this is a test. Not my test. The scriptural test. When you're there, say ready. ready. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at verse 5. I'm going to read it to you. Test yourselves to see if you are where? In the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves? That Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you what? You <laughs> blow the test. You fail. And that's your and my choice. You and I would have the choice every morning when we are awakened to spend the waking hours of each day by faith in Jesus' private office. Physically, we're here, obviously, but you and I have the choice of spending that day where? How would you like to spend the day with Jesus in his private office by faith every day? So that it doesn't matter what happens to you, what do you do? Well, Jesus, I'm being tempted, and you told me to turn all this garbage over to you. That's exactly what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And what is he going to say? Thank you. I already did with all, did with all that garbage 2,000 years ago. <coughs> Salvation is a done deal. Overcoming is a done deal. I'm not asking you to do something I didn't do. Where did 
I say to you, I want for you to do something that I haven't done? Where? Nowhere. We need to get this. This is not about us. This is about putting Jesus to the test. Do we understand what's going on here? We're being tested. I just read it to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Are we going to pass this test or not? That's our choice. Another scripture for this week is 2 Timothy. <coughs> 2 Timothy, to the right of Corinthians, 2 Timothy, chapter 4, who would like to volunteer to read verse 6, verse 6, Linda right here. For I am ready, being poured out as a drink offering, in the time of my departure is a Thank you. Does that remind you of anything? Of someone that who, who who's writing the letter to Second Timothy? Paul. Oh, okay. Yep. Does that remind you of anything in Paul's history in the back? Where hmm. someone recognized that God was ready to pour him out, but he had one more job for this person. <coughs> Do you remember who that was? <coughs> Acts chapter seven. <laughs> Who would like to volunteer to read Acts chapter 7, verses 55 and 56? Acts chapter 7, 55 and 56. Paul just wrote to Timothy saying, Hey, I need for you to get here as soon as you can and bring my coat because it's cold in here in this jail and they're not, you know, giving me any covering. Winter is coming and I want for you to bring some parchments with me. With me. Isn't that amazing? He's in a jail. He's cold. And who's he concerned about? Poor me? Poor him? Timothy, get yourself here as fast as you can. Winter is coming. I need my coat and I need my parchments. Who wants to read verses 55 and 56 of Acts chapter 7? <coughs> But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Does Jesus ever put us in a situation where he doesn't first prepare us for that situation? Isn't that good news? So if we're experiencing faith, then are we concerned about what's happening to us? What anyone is saying to us or doing to us? Whether it's burning us at the stake? That's what Pastor Meg, when he quoted Revelation 14, quote. Here's the endurance of the saints. Here they that what? Faith of Jesus. And that's the only test. In Luke 18, 8, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes back, what's he looking for? Faith. Paul's formula is in 1 Corinthians 15, I die daily. But when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's the question. Will there be some day of people that are experiencing the faith of Jesus? Yes. 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 But you and I are the ones that are living right now. Does everyone here have a pulse? Okay. So, yes, me too, sister. So, it, it, it's in our lap right now. What are we going to do with this? What are we going to do with this? We're not going to heaven. You're not going to heaven because your spouse is going to heaven. You're not going to heaven because your grandchildren or your children are going to heaven. You're not going to heaven because your pastor is going to heaven. You're going to heaven only because you understand the issue here. 
Are you prepared to pass the test? And that is faith. Judy. You have to have the mind of Jesus Christ. This mind being in you. That attitude. That yeah. disposition. Right. That's crucial. I'm going to come to you. That's crucial because in Matthew, did, did Jesus know what his job was, what his mission was when he came here? Yeah. He even told his disciples three times, hey, it's time to go to Jerusalem, it's time for you to die. And this, you know, they just, what? What? You walked in the water, you raised people from the dead, you fed five, ten thousand, whatever. And you, you, you won't first go with you to Jerusalem because you're going to die. Now that may sound very silly to you. Where do you think that they learned this? Where do you think that they got the idea of what kind of a Messiah was coming? Rabbis. Huh? At home, in church, yeah. mm -hmm. and in school. We need to be very careful about the pieces of literature that we read. I'm not talking about a person's sincerity. I'm talking about their understanding and surrendering to truth. Or you will be deceived. That's according to Jesus, Matthew 24, 24. I was just going to say, I, I, I teach my children and grandchildren, and you may disagree with my method, but I tell them that the final exam for mankind is going to be the National Sunday Law. Mm -hmm. No matter how you've lived, you pass that, and you will be saved. Now, I understand that there's going to be other things you need to clean up, okay. But you need to prepare for that final exam that's coming on this world. And that's going to be the sun law. Don't fail that test. From the standpoint of a Christian experience, How do we make sure that we pass the Sunday law test? Why are you here today? Someone told you you need to come here to say it? Huh? The Bible says that. To learn to be grounded in Him. Okay. Welcome. Well, as Pastor said, he quoted, I die daily. said we need the mind of Christ. But as we've been studying, we can't get the mind of Christ unless we do die to self completely and let that mind fill us. Perfect. So, but why should I die to self? Why should I die to self? Take me to scripture. I'm not interested in opinions. Why should I die to self? Because self is conflicting with the truth of God. Paul said, I die daily. Why? Creating me a, a new heart, all the Lord, as a scripture in the Bible that talks about Wonderful response. <laughs> Wonderful response. Two things got my attention, got me straightened out. The first one, is that my sinful nature cannot be fixed. It's got to be killed. Do we understand that? You know what killed me? Spiritually speaking. <laughs> Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is a deceitful thing and desperately incurable. That's what the Hebrew word means. Incurable. Once you understand that, then go and read Genesis chapter 1. Especially verse 31, where we learn that God created everything from what? Nothing. Nothing. Does that get your attention? And after doing that for six days, he looks around and he says, Wow, this is very good. And then in verse 1, chapter 2 of Genesis, he says, This is not only very good, but I, as I look around, I can't see anything, I can't think of anything that I could possibly create for the human race to make them happier. So I'm going to bless this and I'm going to sanctify it by creating what? Service. Seventh day. 
This day is a celebration of a perfect in quantity, quality, and complete in quantity creation. And if you believe that the same one that could create everything from nothing in six literal days is capable of helping you overcome, regardless of what Satan throws at you, then and only then you should come to church on Sabbath. Because that's what Sabbath means. Resting in a complete in quantity and perfect in quality creation. And that same power that created everything from nothing in, I'm going to keep saying this, okay? even though you get bored, in six literal days is capable of giving you the victory over what? So, and that is the issue. Are you prepared to turn self over to Christ? Revelation 14. That is the issue. Until we're ready to do that, we're just wasting our time, spinning our wheels. And when I say wasting, God understands our frame of reference. God understands our level of intelligence. God understands our level of educa formal education. He understands that. But what we're talking about here is not living the Christian life. What we're talking about here is vindicating the character of God so that what? We will bring about the end of time on this earth. Amen. That's the issue. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus gave us this formula. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You know, that, that goes along with Galatians 2, 20, and crucify with Christ. And what, we, what you said earlier in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, examine yourselves, <clears throat> see if you're dead. And if you're dead in Christ, then all these things we're talking about are a byproduct of that. The, the Sunday law, or, or whatever we're talking about, will be a byproduct of our relationship with Jesus Christ. We won't have to even think about it. If we're, we won't be looking at a counterfeit, we'll be looking at Him. If we're looking at Him, nothing else will matter. Amen. Amen. So this brother shared a very interesting thought. With us. The issue of the test is the Sunday law. But when the time comes, we've heard about the bullet coming. But when the bullet is right here, what did Jesus do when the bullet was right here? He told his disciples, we've got to go to Jerusalem, you know, I've got to die. In Matthew 26, 39 through 44, what does he say three times? Lord, if there's any way possible to get me out of this, please do it now. What aspect of Jesus is Offering that first that prayer. The human nature. The sinful nature that he took on in order to ethically and legally save him. But aren't you glad that that's not where the prayer ends? Nevertheless, not. But thy will be done. And that's where the dying comes in. Jesus would not, I don't believe, I know, he would not have allowed himself to be nailed physically to those boards. Had he not first what? Died to self. Yes, Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Luke says it a little that applies more to me in Luke 9, 23. Dying daily. That's my challenge. Oh, I just want to throw this off here because a lot of Adventists believe this. That if we're waiting for the mailman to come to bring us a newspaper <laughs> headline that says, the Sunday law is now force and now we can you know, rally up to that where to see we need to have the victory not prepare we need to have the victory for the Sunday law right now <coughs> right now and that's why I brought up Jesus' experience in Gethsemane he knew that Sunday law for him was coming didn't he our Sunday law was coming for him yet he pushed it but when the time came to make a choice he asked is there any option here that I can get out of this? If we are not dead to self, when that Sunday law comes, we're sucked in. And for many people who work in the public sector, that Sunday law could come tomorrow. If you want to keep your job, 
we need to work on sanity. And many people have faced that in the, in the past. Any questions on this point? And the way that you and I can prepare ourselves each week for the time of trouble is coming to church not on the seventh day of the week, Saturday, but on the what? Sabbath day. The spiritual aspect of Sabbath is resting in a, here we go again, a perfect and complete creation. In a perfect redemption. Isn't that why Jesus rested on the Sabbath? So you and I must reach the point where we say, I got it. I got it. I'm ready to die to self. It doesn't matter what happens to me. Now we're ready for the Sunday law. Now we're ready to what? Yeah. The time of my departure has come. But that's okay because my mindset is focused on what? I'm resting in Him. Is that a good reason to decide to rest in Christ? That He created everything from nothing in six literal days? Are you tired of me saying that? Can you think of any other evidence? Is there something in this world that you're just not ready to give up yet? Before you die to self? Be honest with yourself. You don't need to raise your hand and say anything. But is there something that you're just not ready to give up yet? This is a test. You answer. Your response is between you and God. Uh, verse 7 of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Who would like to read that for us? 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Thank you. That's a very interesting choice of words there. I have kept, not faith, but what? Oh. Definite article T A G. What is he talking about? Jesus. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3 right now. Keep your finger there, 2 Timothy. Galatians chapter 3. When you're there, say ready. I'm going to read verse 23. I'm going to read it to you the way it appears in the original language of the New Testament. But before the faith came, I know your Bible say before faith came, but in the original language you have the definite article T-H-E between, between before and faith. You need to mark that in your Bible. Before the faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith. That is correct. Which was later to be revealed. 24. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we may be what? <laughs> Who brings me to Christ? To, uh, to Christ? Look at 25. But now that the, you need to insert T-H-E there, between that and faith, but now that the faith has come, we are no longer under what? A tutor. So here in three verses, you have the expression, the faith, wrote out four times. This is crucial. Because there's only one faith. And that is the faith that conquered Satan in my nature 2,000 years ago. Is that good enough for you? You have to decide that. That's the issue. Is that good enough for you? Or are you still not ready to give up one little something that is so attractive in this world, you're just not ready to give it up? 
That's a personal question, but I want an audible answer. That's a personal response that you have to make. Uh, it's the same idea in Hebrews 12, where it says, uh, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of the word R is in italics. It's the supplied word. So it's the gospel. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, the faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down to the right and the right hand. And so Jesus is the author and finisher. He finished what he came to do. It is complete, it is perfect, and there's nothing we can add to it. And that's why we rest in him. Beautiful thought. Beautiful expression. Okay, let's flip back to 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 4. Who would like to read verse 8? Diane? Finally. Wait a minute, hang on. Everybody there? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Okay. Finally, there is laid out for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Wow. The crown of righteousness laid for Paul as a what? A reward. And for who else? Oh. All of them who follow. That have what? Loved what? His appearance. His appearance. Which means when you love something, how frequently do you talk about it or think about it? Yeah. Yeah. What does the word righteousness mean? Right doing. Okay. Good. Very good, Warren. Over here. I was going to go back to the appearing part. Some people don't recognize his appearance when he comes. Just as they didn't uh, recognize him when they crucified him. They don't recognize him now either. They see uh, you know, it's evil or something like that. They don't realize he, he's coming you know, for judgment. They're all like, who is this? What is that? They don't realize it's him. Good point. And uh, how do these people that don't care or maybe afraid of the judgment, what is their understanding of the word judgment? So let them be a There's two ways of using the word judgment in the Bible. Yes. One is what? You can fear judgment and you can look forward to it. For the who? Unbelievers, the ones that don't have, choose not to exercise faith. Yeah. They're terrified, and they should be. Mm -hmm. Then you have the who? The believers. The believers. And for them, the word judgment means what? The reward. reward. Yes. Is that good news? Yes. Can we get excited about that? Yes. yes. What does the word righteousness mean? Give you a hint. No. It, it comes from the old English of 1600. Okay? If I were to, if this was a Bible study, and it is, but during the week <laughs> we're in a home somewhere in a room, and someone comes in late, I come in late, and Carl is leading out in the Bible study, and there's one chair available. You know about this? Thank you. There's one chair available. And it's leaning against the table like that. Carl says, welcome Chuck. Right the chair and join us. If I try to sit, this is a chair, use your imagination. 